get amino acids quite easily by spark discharge experiments. The very famous Uri Miller experiment, Professor Uri was, you know, Professor Miller was part of UCSD. He founded the chemistry department at UCSD in, in the early 1960s. And then, you know, the um, spark discharge experiments, you make amino acids, you find them in meteors. So therefore people said, you know, first they must have joined somehow to give proteins because the amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And therefore proteins came first and then you were able to make these kind of, you know, other complex molecules. But then, you know, later on people who were studying RNA came up with the idea that RNA is a molecule that could self-replicate, transfer information and at the same time act as in, you know, a catalyst. The proteins cannot transfer information. Therefore, they said it must be an RNA world that came about first a self-replicating informational and catalytic molecule, which then gave rise to proteins because the ribosome synthesized proteins. And therefore they said it must be an RNA world. Then there were people like said, no, 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 hold on. You know, it must be metabolism because how do you make these building blocks? It is the metabolism that makes it. And therefore it must be the small metabolic cycle type of systems that must have come about. And then there were people who said, hold on, you need to put them all together in a sack. Otherwise they will get diluted in the ocean and they will get lost. So it must have been a lipid. So the, you know, it was like these kind of different parts of the problems were being attacked and people came up with these models. And these are all because you are trying to run biology backwards to what was earlier there before. Though that means it's like you are looking at the finished product and you are looking at the raw materials and you are trying to draw a straight line between two points that are separated by nearly billions of years. Okay, and that leak has its own problems. So this is what we have. So we have prebiotic chemistry, the chemistry that happened before biology appeared, and then we have biology which is based on biochemistry. And the question is, how do you connect those? So for example, prebiotic chemistry can give you these kind of bases by simple uh, hydrogen cyanide polymerization, or you can even find them in meteorites. And this sugar is difficult to get, but there are ways to get it if you want to under abiotic conditions, which can be pushed to early earth-like conditions. But the question is, can you bring them together to give rise to these kind of molecules, which was what biology uses? the same way, but it, you know, people have tried this for a long time and still there is no very good solution of bringing these together. It's actually very difficult. And if you look how biochemistry makes these, biochemistry does not make these fully made nucleobases and connect them. It actually goes through a very elaborate procedure of purine biosynthesis and pyrimidine biosynthesis, nucleoside biosynthesis, which looks nothing like what prebiotic chemistry does. The same is true for amino acids. You know, if you start only with amino acids, you can try to bring them together, but again, it involves quite a lot of manipulation in the lab to do that without you know, chemical attrition. They don't come together on their own. So what this tells us is this type of approach of trying to connect prebiotic chemistry on early earth to extant biology that this life is using today is probably not the best approach to look at it. You know, you can't just reach back in time and say, you know, I want to find only the things that I find today in life and then somehow make it. There is a different approach and that's what I want to bring to the table here today. So this approach has been inefficient and it's debatable whether this is exactly the way things happen. Of course, there is no way knowing it, but you know, it has been quite difficult to reconstruct what would have happened just based on what biology uses today. So, what we have, you know, off late the approach has been not to look at only what life uses, but actually ask the question, you know, is, you know, is, uh, prebiotic chemistry would have been very different on early earth. Early earth had a very different atmosphere composition than what we have today. Okay, for example, oxygen level was much lower and it's only about 200, uh, 2.5 billion years ago that oxygen suddenly rose to the levels that are almost what we have today. So before it was quite anoxic. So looking, as I said, and the, you know, you should remember this, the structural similarity of molecules that you find in life today with the structural similarity of molecules that you find in meteorites and, you know, prebiotic chemistry does not mean, you know, that there is a direct connection. So 
what we took an approach was to look for alternatives. That means what would have been the whole mixture of molecules that would have been available on early Earth, plausibly, and see if the mixture can give rise to things naturally. You know, not that we know what we want. Remember, that's the approach. We know what life looks like, and therefore we are trying to reconstruct it based on what we would have been there on earlier. Rather than knowing what we want, can we just let the system teach us where it will go? And therefore, we can try to see what the system teaches us rather than making it go where we want, because that is a teleological approach, which we do not want to do when we want to understand how life arose on Earth. The question was, are there indirect pathways? So, for example, I'm going to show you an example where we were able to do that and, and you know, give you a principle of how we can approach it. So here is the amino acids. These are, you know, that's an amine group, NH2. That's a carboxylic acid. These are alpha amino acids. And these are what makes our peptides and proteins and enzymes in your body. And it's very difficult to take this and make it into a peptide by driving off water between two molecules because this acid amine exists as what we call a zwitter ion. Zwitter means two, ion means ion charges. There are two charges because this exists as a protonated NH2, what we call an ammonium, and this is a carboxylate. And therefore, it's very difficult to drive water away from them. But if you look at alpha hydroxy acids, and what is the big difference between that? It is we have replaced an NH2 group with an OH, a hydroxy group. These are called alpha hydroxy acids. These you might know from your skin refreshers and things like that. And these alpha hydroxy acids actually are much easier to polymerize. And these form, you know, just by a simple drying condition, what we call polyesters. And polyesters, you might know, these are polymeric materials that are used to make textiles and things like that. So these polyesters are very easy to form. But is that the only reason we should consider alpha hydroxy acids? Remember, I told you that we have to be constrained by what might have been available on early Earth, right? Therefore, we have to ask the question, yes, chemistry, modern chemistry is telling us, yes, we can take these and polymerize them. Amino acids are not that easy, but we can't just use that alone. We have to know whether these alpha hydroxy acids were available or would have been available on early Earth. So for that, we have to look in the context of prebiotic chemistry. And if you actually go to this very famous, you know, Murray Miller spark discharge experiment, and I hope many of you know about this, it is when Stanley Miller, under the direction of Urey, Harold Urey at University of Chicago, mixed gases such as, you know, ammonia and then methane and then, you know, water and then, you know, a spark discharge. And, you know, there was like, you know, it was simulating lightning and rain on early Earth. And when the spark discharge was given, all these gases, they condensed and they reacted with each other and they made a, a brownish goo, which they analyzed and they found amino acids. They found alanine, glycine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and a whole slew of other non-canonical, that is the amino acids that were not used in our body. But the surprising thing was, it was almost a representative was what was found on meteorites, okay? So that means this kind of chemistry not happens not only here, but also in the type of, you know, spaces that, you know, Dr. Quimby was talking about. You can make these kind of molecules within the stellar um, evolution, and then they get incorporated into rocks, and then they get delivered as meteorites or asteroids. And the question, you know, was, you know, are amino acids, so that was actually one of the inspirations for people to take, look, amino acids are prebiotic, therefore let's go to a protein world and make them. But the thing is, if you, you know, when people look carefully, there were not only amino acids, there were also alpha hydroxy acids in the mixture. And that teaches you an important lesson. That means when you analyze something, don't just look for what you want, also look what is there because that might turn out to be more important than what you're looking for. You know, because it's, it's a, it's a, it should be an unbiased way of looking that it informs you of what are the possibilities rather than exactly what you want. There are merits to, you know, looking for what you want, but when you're asking these broad questions of how things would have been and how things would progress, you have to look at the whole and not just the part. So bottom line, 
the Ure Miller experiments also produces alpha hydroxy acids. But if you go and look at the science paper that was published in 1954, the same year the Watson Creek Helix was published, there will be no mention of alpha hydroxy acids. It's mostly amino acids because that is what is standing out. And it's also true for the meteorites. When you analyze the meteorites, it was done by Jeff Beda at UCSD, who was a student of Stanley Miller. And you also see hydroxy acids, plenty of hydroxy acids. Actually, these hydroxy acids sometimes far exceed the amino acids. So now you ask the question, you are bringing this mixture on early earth. Why are you ignoring the alpha hydroxy acids and focusing only on amino acids? That is because you are focusing on what life is using, right? And so we are biased by life in what we are looking for and we ignore the alpha hydroxy acid. And there is a second more important reason, especially nowadays, it's that it does not make headline news. You know, if Stanley Miller had come up and said, oh, I found alpha hydroxy acid in my spark discharge experiment, it would not have been published in science and it would have not got the notoriety it did by New York Times covering it immediately. Life found on spark discharge experiment, right? And so this kind of bias is actually holding us back from understanding how this might evolve this. Now you might ask, okay, you have said all this, but how does alpha hydroxy acid help you actually? You know, does it really help you in making peptides when the amino acid doesn't? And actually it does. So the question is, instead of starting with pure amino acids and trying to make peptides, which is probably not a prebiotically plausible because there are mixtures in on earlier, can peptides really come from this mixture? If I make alpha hydroxy acid and the amino acid, would I get peptides? And so the question we asked ourselves was this. If we mix that, you know, remember previously people used to start only with amino acids, but now we are mixing these two. And the question is, if we mix them and simply dry and wet, it's like a, a rain falling down, creating a puddle, and then the sun coming out, drying the puddle, and then the rain coming back, and you repeat this cycle. You know, it's like what we call a wet dry cycle, which happens naturally in many places on earth. So the question was, would it happen? And one of the hypotheses that I, you know, I suggested to many of my colleagues was that if you take this and you know, this is what chemistry teaches us, this is organic chemistry, that if you take an acid, hydroxy acid, you will make a polyester, which is known from actually, again, from a very famous person at UCSD, Murray Goodman, who worked in peptide chemistry. And then the question is, if you take this, now you have the amino acid also there and this NH2 group, what is we call an amine group, can attack what we call this ester bond because now this ester bond is activated. It has you know, a higher energy compared to a pure carboxylic acid. And therefore, the NH2 will attack and what you will form is now is called an amide bond or a peptide bond if you use uh, amino acids, which is what is very difficult. But with an ester, you can do that. And then you see again, now what you have is a free carboxylic acid again. So that means this group is now free again, just like here. And therefore what will happen is you can do another, what we call an esterification with the alpha hydroxy acid, makes an ester bond, which then gets attacked by another amine group from the amino acid, makes another free ester, you know, carboxylic acid, which can be re-esterified. That means this process can be repeated again and again. And what you find is naturally from this mixture, what you get are these peptide bonds without even you wanting them because it's driven by the thermodynamics of a stable peptide bond versus the kinetic you know, facility or you know, fee, feasibility of forming an ester bond. So you are playing this ester bond that you form first because it's easier to form. And because it's easier to form, it's also easier to hydrolyze. You know, the, the barrier is low for hydrolysis. But then if you have a new good nucleophile, the amine attacks it and makes a peptide bond or an amide bond, which is more difficult to hydrolyze. So that means you're starting with systems and then you're going to lower and lower in energy system. So it's a thermodynamically driven process that naturally ends up in peptide bonds. So that means you can envision on the early earth. So going back to Dr. Kimby's uh, caveat, this is not early earth. This is just an artistic de depiction of an early earth and where chemistry could have happened. Okay, so you can think of such ponds which are drying out, puddles which are drying out and coming back again because of the rain, where if you did this 
Of course, things are going to be far more complicated. You know, remember, I use just amino acids and carboxylic acids here, uh, hydroxy acid. But how does this tie into what, what is biology doing? You can say, okay, look, you are made your peptides, right? But how does this tie into what life is using today? And actually, before I go to that, I'll show you how we, um, you know, the technique that we use, it's called mass spectrometry, where we use um, an instrument that measures the molecular weight of molecules that you make in your mixture. And here is just the amino acid alone. And if you look for higher molecular weights, the, mission, the instrument does not detect any because it's not forming it. But if you take the hydroxy acid alone, in this case, it's lactic acid, you can see you immediately make polymers and you know, very nice polymers and you mix them together what we call, we, we get a mixture of amino acids and like, you know, hydroxy acid mixed together, what are known as depth C peptides. And you can actually go and, you know, interrogate each of these peaks by what is known as an MSMS sequencing technique. And you can actually find as the mechanism predicts, you have a hydroxy acid and you have a lot of peptide bonds in that particular sequence of depth C peptide. So, if you just started only from amino acid because life is using you know, only amino acids, it's very difficult to get this under prebiotic condition. But if you allow for a mixture that would exist in prebiotic chemistry, actually this becomes natural, it becomes easy. And this is exactly what biology does. In the biology, there is a molecule called ribosome and that ribosome actually takes um, an RNA charged with an amino acid with another tRNA, charged with an amino acid and look, this is what the ester bond is. And it makes an ester bond and brings them together so that the amine groups attacks an ester bond and makes the amide bond. You can see that. And that's exactly the chemistry that I showed you here, but without the fancy ribosome. Okay, so that means the chemistry is pretty fundamental and that teaches you an important lesson that the chemical principles and the physical principles have not changed over time. They are the same. And that is also true for what is known as a non-ribosomal peptide synthesis, which is used in biology. And the point here is that if you do not look at what biology is doing, but you look at what prebiotic chemistry can do, it may actually connect you, you know, very nicely without you even wanting it and, you know, forcing it to happen. And that's the idea. So, Instead of trying to force this with only amino acid and saying, okay, this is the only way I can go to biology, you can actually think of a switch where now you use a mixture with alpha hydroxy acids and actually it becomes a more like a, a switch where you start with depsy peptides and then you switch to peptides in biology. But what is very similar throughout is the same amino acids and the mechanism of an ester to peptide exchange. So by cons 